so we've been talking about, you know, a few small, well, first small modes, then a little bit bigger modes, <laughs> and, and now we have to face up to the fact that if you had an unstable plasma, in fact, you'd probably have a lot of modes, all kind of about the same amplitude. I mean, the thing we begin to worry about is we remember in instabilities seem to have the possibility for a lot of different unstable modes, a lot of different omegas and k's could be unstable. It wasn't just one particular one. So it's unlikely that we would have a single coherent mode, but rather we, what we have is uh, likely to have a whole bunch of modes. And so the question is, how, how do we treat um, the situation with many uh, nearly equal amplitude modes. How many is many, by the way, in this case? Well, it turns out uh, you can almost think of it as there's a sort of funny way people describe it. It's called one, two, infinity. Uh, you take one mode and you can do things, okay? I mean, you know, we had this nonlinear mode. Two modes, you can sometimes get their interaction, okay, and treat that even nonlinearly. For example, two solitons will just pass through each other. You can have one soliton move this way and another one this way, and they can actually pass through each other uh, and not deform each other. They just pass right through each other. So you can have things like that. But somehow it seems that once you get up to about three, you're, you're, it's as if you've gotten into the many regime. Okay, and there are other reasons. It's a sort of, you, you know, with one you only have, with two actually, uh, you imagine a two-body problem. Okay, you can treat that as a harmonic oscillator type problem with slight nonlinearities, and you can work that through to some extent. But you add another for another body, and somehow or other things get so complicated that you're more or less in a statistical description. Um, what kind of a problem in some other area of physics, science, would be relevant to this? Similar, might we think. How about fluid turbulence? Well, indeed, that turns out to be more or less the proper, it would appear, analogy. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about fluid turbulence, very um, briefly and cryptically, I might say. What do you do in fluid turbulence? Well, you know, we got a pipe here, let's say, and we have a velocity flow down the pipe uh, because we impose a pressure gradient from one end to the other. How do we calculate what goes on in there? Well, what we know happens is that, roughly speaking, if the Reynolds number is high enough, and the Reynolds number here is the ratio basically of the magnitude of the inertia term. Uh, it's basically the, the ratio of the inertia term, V dot del V, times the mass density, divided by the uh, viscosity, or the dissipation, which is a sort of new del squared V. So it's inertia non, or nonlinearity over dissipation. Anyway, if this is very large, what we know happens is that we don't just get a nice, simple fluid flow profile, but it breaks up into all kinds of turbulent eddies. So it's, it's uh, you know, you get uh, turbulent flow down the pipe. What kind of a description do you use to describe that? Well, uh, people in dealing with fluid turbulence, first off, it's not in some general sense a totally solved problem. Um, say, well, look, inertia is very important for most ranges of wave numbers or spatial scales because, uh, well, uh, for most spatial scales, inertia is much bigger than dissipation. But then at very small scale lengths, uh, the grad squared becomes big, and when it becomes big, uh, then actually I can get the Reynolds number down, the dissipation becomes comparable to the nonlinear inertial processes. That's, I should say, nonlinear and inertial. So what happens is that if I look as a function of k-space, 
at, say, velocity fluctuations as a function of k, then at very short scale lengths, I have my dissipation because of I run into the viscosity. And there, I, I have fairly small amplitude, it turns out, fluctuations. But at very, that, that, and that's at very large k. And then at very small k, that's where I'm putting in the energy because I'm demanding that there be a flow gradient from here to here that is some finite magnitude because I'm, I'm pushing it along with the pressure. So what happens is you get a, a, a spectrum of fluctuations. And I shouldn't just do v squared. I should be, do v tilde squared, uh, v not by itself, but squared. And so in some sense, you stir okay, at the longest wavelength or the smallest k. And then you dissipate at, at the largest k, at which k is of order k uh, nu, some dissipation scale length. And if you go in here and balance at each k, um, the uh, rate of energy flow from the where I stir it to the short wavelengths, it turns out that you can show that this spectrum should be, I'm, I'm always forgetting, but anyway, it's like k to the minus 5 thirds, which is the so-called Kolomogorov uh, spectrum. Kolomogorov. So the basic idea that I'm kind of trying to get at here is that, roughly speaking, in a, in a fluid, you get big eddies and little ed and medium sized eddies and little eddies okay this breaks up into eddies just like water going down your bathtub you know makes a, a vortex flow and this breaks up into vortexes vortices or eddies but uh, and, and what happens is that the long scale vortices transfer through these nonlinear processes their energy to slightly shorter scale and shorter scale and shorter scale until they finally dissipate it in the dissipation layer now, what happens in a plasma? Is it the same sort of thing? Well, it turns out we certainly have large Reynolds number situations. You may remember we've had weak dissipation. Collisions were kind of weak. Landau damping is kind of weak, and so forth and so on. So in general, it's sort of the same type of thing. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about plasma turbulence. Um, uh, so let's say sort of like fluid turbulence. And let's say the effective, it's a little bit tricky, uh, but anyway, Reynolds numbers. And they're not actually Reynolds numbers because they're ratios not of, of uh, inertial nonlinearities to viscous dissipation, but inertial nonlinearities to magnetic reconnection rates or magnetic uh, uh, diffusion rates or something like that. So anyway, uh, effective Reynolds numbers uh, can be quite large. Um, for example, one that comes in, you remember that we treated uh, magnetic field diffusion. We said, well, magnetic field mostly moves by V cross B. Plasma moves with the magnetic field frozen into a conducting, uh, conducting, conduction, well, frozen in like it's a very good conductor. On the other hand, we also had diffusion uh, plus 8 over mu naught del squared B. And if you take the ratio of this is diffusion and this is a nonlinear convection, the ratio of those two is usually called S, and it's called the Lundquist number, or sometimes called the magnetic Reynolds number. And this is the ratio of the what's called the resistive diffusion time, which is the time scale for balancing uh, the resistive diffusion against time and versus the uh, 
Alfane time scale, which is um, the time scale for that convection. And in typical plasmas today, laboratory plasmas, this can range up to 10 to the 8th. In, uh, so that's certainly a large enough Reynolds number for us. Uh, it can even range to 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 12th in, in space applications, it turns out. So these are sort of very often very, very high Reynolds numbers. On the other hand, there's another effect. Um, so this is sort of maybe the first effect, is that the effective Reynolds number can be large. Um, the other effect is that often the particular... Um, modes or, or vortices, sort of uh, modes or vortices uh, or nonlinear structures are often smaller scale than the, micro, the macroscopic scale length. Remember in our analogy of uh, water flow down a pipe, the biggest vortex is in fact the radius of the pipe. Or, okay? But usually what happens is in plasma turbulence, the uh, scale length is, is probably, although this is somewhat controversial, uh, and in many cases not necessarily, well, in many cases it seems to be true, some cases it's not. Is, is less than some A, which is sort of like 1 over N, DN, DR, some, you know, radius of the plasma or something like that. So the idea is then that um, in contrast to pipe flow, if we have a density uh, profile like this, whereas in, in um, Navier-Stokes turbulence we would have a vortex, vortex which would go over the whole radius here, you sort of imagine little little wiggles, okay, that are sort of localized to some some little uh, fraction of the radius, maybe 10%, something like that. Now, how do you treat that case? Well, um, it's somewhat controversial, and it's a, a topic of great present interest, let me just say it that way. So it's not a, a settled issue. But one of the popular things to do these days is to do um, is to try to include turbulent scattering of one mode, you know, one e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, or one vortex, or whatever, uh, or one coherent structure, one soliton, etc., uh, by all the other modes. Now, I use the word turbulent scattering, diffusion, you know, that sort of thing. So if we go back to our density evolution equation, it's sort of imagining that what would happen is that this was my starting equation here. And you remember we linearized it. We get dn dt uh, basically is equal to minus vx tilde dn naught dx, or for v tilde dot grad equilibrium. And then we get a whole bunch of nonlinear terms. And roughly speaking, what's done is by what's called a direct interaction approximation. What one does is one says, well, gosh, all the other modes, I'll just count those modes which resonantly interact with a particular mode that I'm interested in. That's the direct interaction. And then I only count the ones that are involved that way, resonantly, and so that's the approximation aspect. And I expect them and sort of prove under some assumptions or approximately get that it just produces a diffusion, okay, of the mode. So what it does is it, by direct interaction, maybe I should put that in red so we realize it. Um, so it says that the mode does not just get convected, which is what this term represents, but in addition it gets diffused by the presence of all the other modes. 
And then if you go and calculate that, which is what the essence of the direct interaction approximation is, you can show that the dk, which means the diffusion of the kth mode, e to the i k dot x particular k, is the sum over all the other modes, okay, of the fluctuations vxk tilde squared divided by sort of the growth rate of the k, uh, k prime plus k mode plus k, kx squared times the diffusion coefficient itself. Uh, the reason is that um, in some sense, d by dt represents a growth rate, and so there's a decorrelation of the density fluctuations with the uh, flow fluctuations by gamma. But what happens, so this is sort of like, uh, if you look at it this way, this is sort of like a gamma, and this is sort of like kx squared d. So you get decorrelations of the density fluctuations with the potential or flow fluctuations, both because maybe it's growing, but also because it's turbulently scattering. So this is sort of uncomfortable to have uh, the diffusion coefficient depend upon the diffusion coefficient, right? But the, you then go to two limits of this, and one is a so-called quasi-linear or small amplitude limit in which you neglect the, D, the gamma, the k squared d in the denominator. And then what happens is that you say that Vx tilde is approximately gamma uh, divided by kx. And notice this is a sort of delta x over delta t. I mean, a, a, flow, a flow jiggle is a, how much I'm going to move in space divided by how much of a jiggle I do in time. And then what you find this diffusion coefficient goes over to is the growth rate over kx squared. Namely, it's just our old standard diffusion coefficient is delta x squared over delta t, with the delta x is 1 over the x wave, wavelength in the x direction, or is the x wavelength, and the time is governed by the growth rate. On the other hand, if I go, so this is, so let me, I'm sorry, let me write that on the, on the next slide. So this is delta squared over tau c, I'll make a, in the strong turbulence limit. So let me kind of rewrite that a bit, let me be safer here. So what you have is that dk is equal to sum over k prime, actually, uh, vx tilde uh, k squared divided by gamma k plus k prime. Um, plus kx squared uh, dk prime. And it turns out this goes over to then either gamma over kx squared, which is the um, what's called the quasi-linear result. And it has effectively, you remember, this diffu any diffusion coefficient is always at least um, uh, dimensionally, a, a diffusion, you know, a, a step length squared divided by, in space, divided by step in time. And so this has the spatial step is 1 over kx, and the time step is 1 over the growth rate. Okay? On the other hand, that, so obviously what I've done to get the quasi-linear is I just wiped out that diffusion part down, that turbulent diffusion scattering part down there. On the other hand, I could have done the opposite. I could have said, and, and uh, I'm sorry, this is quasi-linear or weak turbulence, sometimes called. It's often not rigorously valid, but anyway. Whereas if I had marked out the growth rate, I've come up to some saturation, then you see I would get, I could pull out the D here. Actually, that's a D of K plus K prime if it's reasonably homogeneous in k-space, I can bring it out, and then I just get the square root of all this. And the net result, if you work that through, uh, is that you get vx tilde over k, uh, or kx. It turns out you can also write this as the correlation, the turbulent correlation length squared in radius divided by the turbulent correlation in time, which is not much help because then you have to go calculate those.
So this is the strong turbulence limit. And sometimes people do one other thing. Uh, they do something called mixing length theory. And in that, what you do is you say that uh, just that the diffusion coefficient is delta x squared over delta t, and then you use one of the two of these or something else if you choose to do so. I mean, there are just various things you can do. Uh, now, let me finally wind this up by telling you a kind of particular example. Um, we always end up with diffusion coefficients go like delta x squared over delta t. And the only question is what I put in for delta x, what I put in for delta t. Well, I want to briefly discuss uh, if you consider, um, let's call it E cross B. Um, this is a flow velocity, okay, B squared approximately equal to Vx tilde, um, just E cross B diffusion. Then you can work all of this back, and what you can show is that the diffusion coefficient becomes of the order of uh, CTE over EB times uh, the sum over K of E phi tilde over TE, quantity squared, and this is the kth one, all to the one-half. Um, you can also show that this part alone is the gyro radius times the thermal velocity. So if I had just taken that I was diffusing, I was going along at the velocity V thermal, and I was taking, um, I'm sorry, uh, I've got to have, uh, oh, sorry, right, yeah. And, and I took a, a step um, row every so often, okay. Um, well, another way of doing this, uh, sorry, better perhaps, is that this is then uh, V thermal squared over uh, omega C. Uh, so that would be, you know, uh, big steps, let me just say it that way. But then the E cross B diffusion, if I imagine that the maximum amplitude I could ever get for E cross B fluctuations would be E phi tilde over T of about 1. Maximum fluctuation surely about the electron temperature. That's the most I could get. Then you see I would get this scaling here. And a particular scaling, uh, true, uh, which people kind of liked in the late 60s, was something called Bohm scaling, which was 1 16th CT over EB. And this was called Bohm scaling, uh, Bohm diffusion, uh, which had been observed in various um, types of very small devices where the devices were no more than a few Larmor radii across and probably the vortex cells were about as big as the plasma. But usually these days it's, we have fluctuation levels down about one percent or a hundredth of a percent or something in many of the hottest big plasmas and so this is, is quite small and so it's no longer a very relevant sort of formula. But again the basic idea is when you have many modes as opposed to a single mode you have to go into some sort of turbulent scattering DIA approximation to the diffusion and turbulence effects on particular modes, and you calculate how that gets to some saturation. You then estimate the net step sizes in the plasma or decorrelation lengths for the vortices or eddies and decorrelation times, how long do they last, and then you can estimate the turbulent diffusion. So we'll quit here for this, and then next time what we'll do is we'll start in talking about fusion, fusion both inertial and magnetic. And we'll